Um, yeah, so without without randomness, they can't do better than um, basically one of them just sending their vector to the other. Um, but with randomness, uh, we saw that they could reduce the communication from n field elements all the way down to just two field elements. Um, and the probability in the randomized protocol of them outputting the wrong answer was at most uh, the field was much bigger than the length of the vector, say the field was uh, of size two to the 127 minus one, for example, just to pick a, a nice prime, um, then uh, yeah, for any realistic size vector, this would be like a really, really, really small uh, probability that they made a mistake. Um, and, and what this very small probability of error bought us was the communication fell from uh, basically Alice having to send her whole vector to Bob to Alice just sending, um, uh, um, and she she picks a random field element R, and and she sends to Bob um, R and uh, her polynomial P evaluated at R. Um, so the most straightforward way for her to interpret her vector as a polynomial is to just interpret it as like the list of coefficients of the polynomial. Uh, you know, any degree n minus one polynomial has n coefficients, and she can just send R and the evaluation of her polynomial at R to Bob, who will just um, check whether um, he'll do the same interpretation to his polynomial, uh, let's say that leads to a polynomial Q, and he'll check whether his polynomial Q evaluated at R equals Alice's polynomial P evaluated at R. And if, if yes, he'll output equal, and if no, he'll output not equal. Um, and we sort of explained the only, the only interesting case in the um, correctness analysis was um, if, if X does not equal Y, um, so he should output not equal, we have to show that the probability that Q of R equals P of R is low. And this just boils down to the fact that since P and Q both have degree at most N, um, the number of R, um, so, uh, okay, I'm gonna introduce some set notation here real fast. So this is the set of R such that P of R equals Q of R. So those are the inputs, um, to P and Q from the field uh, at which they agree. And if I stick these <laughs> absolute values around it, that means the size of the set. So this is the this is denoting the number of agreement points of these polynomials. And uh, we saw that this is at most, um, uh, what is it, their degree? I just have to think, two degree zero polynomials can agree at only zero points. Two degree one polynomials that are not the same can agree at only one point. So. This should be um, n minus one. Um, so yeah, so if, if P does not equal Q and they're both of degree at most n, then the number of points they can agree at is at most n minus one. That was the key fact we saw last time. So the probability that Q of R equals P of R, despite P and Q not being the same polynomial, uh, that probability um, uh, is at most you know, the number of agreement points divided by um, the size of the field since R is chosen at random field. Okay, so that is a pretty complete recap of what we discussed last time. Um, and this is covered um, in chapter two of the book. <clears throat> um, and so today I wanna to start by seeing a second powerful demonstration of the power of randomness, especially when combined with um, low degree polynomials. Um, but this time, um, we're not going to save communication relative to deterministic algorithms, um, as we did here. The goal was, you know, for Alice and Bob to um, exchange as little data as possible. Um, if you only cared about their runtime, then like Alice sending her input X to Bob and Bob reading it is about as, uh, in a sense, as fast as you can get up to a constant factor anyway, because Bob has to at least read his own input at a minimum. Um, and that takes time and just to read his own input. Um, so yeah, last time we saved communication relative to deterministic protocols. Um, today we're gonna use uh, randomness to save time. Um, and this will actually be a situation where we'll also um, have for the first time, um, we're going to think of our algorithm um, as being given access to an untrusted prover. 
Uh, there, there's actually, you could, there are two ways to formulate this um, problem. Um, okay, I, I don't know. Let me, let me just tell you what the problem is. So um, the, the input to the problem is going to be two matrices, um, A and B. So let's say they're both N by N matrices um, with elements, with entries from this field. Um, and the goal is to compute their matrix product, A times B. Um, so just as a reminder, um, in case anyone's rusty on linear algebra, um, the matrix product A times B, I guess if you, um, the ijth entry of that is, um, let's see, let me make sure I, yeah, okay. So we got uh, sum over K from one to N of AIK times BKJ. Right, so um, that's what I mean by compute the matrix product, is compute this, uh, this matrix. Okay, and uh, the fastest known algorithms to do this, um, to go from the input matrices A and B to the product matrix A times B, um, they run in time. Um, okay, uh, so it's, it's at least like end of the 2.3 right now, uh, I think. I don't, uh, it's at least 2.2, I, I don't quite remember. Um, the key point here is, um, that this is super linear time, right? So if these are n by n matrices, um, the input size is n squared. And the fastest known algorithm to um, compute this problem, to solve this problem, runs in time, um, what's called, uh, you know, it's substantially super linear in the input size. Uh, this would be called um, uh, like, Su you know, polynomially super linear time, right? The actually the exponent is different. So it's, you know, like n squared log n would be like only slightly super linear. Uh, this would be called quasi linear time. Uh, this is not, n to the 2.2 is not quasi linear time. Um, it's, you know, polynomially more than linear time. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, bigger than linear by not a poly logarithmic factor, but rather a factor of like n to the 0 0.2 or something. Um, on top of that, the, the algorithms that achieve this sort of runtime are totally impractical. So like the fastest practical algorithms have a runtime of more like n of the 2.7 or 2.8 or something um, are the fastest practical ones. Um, so we are going to be interested in um, kind of obtaining the right answer um, faster than the fastest known algorithm um, to compute the right answer. Um, and this is where we bring in um, possibly an untrusted prover. So we could think of the untrusted prover as sending um, a verifier uh, the claimed product matrix C, and the verifier needs to um, sort of uh, you know accept if uh, C is is the true answer, um, reject otherwise. Okay, so we can think of this as our first probabilistic proof system um, where, uh, yeah, the, the verifier sort of has access to an untrusted prover. Um, the prover, you know, claims to solve a problem um, so that the verifier doesn't have to solve it on its own, thereby saving the verifier work. But the verifier doesn't trust the answer is correct and needs to, uh, needs to check the answer for correctness. Um, and we'll see that the, uh, so actually there, there's no deterministic checking procedure known that's faster than the verifier just ignoring the prover and computing the answer from scratch. So it, it seems um, that randomness might be really the key um, to achieving a, a really fast um, checking procedure. Um, okay, so I, I, I could equivalently formulate the problem um, without bringing in the notion of a prover and a verifier. I could just say, hey, the input to the problem is three matrices. A, B, and C, and the goal is um, to, you know, output, I don't know, yes, if C is uh, equal to the product A times B and no otherwise. So I could, I could formulate the problem equivalently that way. Um, 
And, you know, this ha this makes no reference to an untrusted prover. Here, all the untrusted prover is doing is sending the claim to answer C. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you, for whatever reason, don't like this formulation of there being an untrusted prover and a verifier, um, feel free to just think, hey, it's an algorithms problem. Um, people actually do cover this algorithm in randomized algorithms classes um, without introducing the notion of an untrusted prover. Um, yeah, so you could think of this procedure as just a, a very fast randomized algorithm for solving this problem of checking whether a matrix C is equal to the product of two other matrices A and B. Okay, um, any questions right now? Nope. Okay, so feel free to interrupt whenever uh, you have a question. Uh, I always think that makes things more interesting. Um, okay, so I'm going to just tell you how the protocol, how the algorithm works then. Um, so the, by the way, this, this algorithm has a name called Freevald's algorithm. Uh, it was given in the late 70s, I think. Um, Freevald's actually just died uh, not that long ago, five years ago or something. Um, and uh, yes, it's very simple. I'm actually going to describe sort of a variant of it that um, connects better to um, the communication protocol we saw last uh, last meeting. Um, so here, here's the algorithm. Um, so the verifier, um, or if you don't have a proven verifier, just the algorithm, um, let me just call it the verifier, picks a random R in field, random, uh, random field element R. Um, and let's say let X be the vector of sort of all powers of R up to N minus one. And of course, R to the zero is just one. Yeah. Um, and the verifier simply checks that um, C times R equals uh, A times B times R. Um, and the key point here is we're sort of exploiting heavily associativity of like matrix multiplication and matrix vector multiplication. So, you know, the, the, think of it as like, we're, we're, we're taking the claimed answer and multiplying it by the, I'm sorry, I wrote R, I meant X and multiplying it by the, um, the random vector X. And we're also taking like the true product matrix and multiplying it by the same random vector X. And we're confirming that they agree. Um, and so you can think of this as sort of, um, uh, you could think of this as kind of like a, a, a fingerprint of the matrix C. Uh, very like lit, completely analogous to, um, the, I hopefully I discussed last session, um, how to view or uh, the communication protocol as a fingerprinting protocol, um, where um, the polynomial uh, P corresponding to Alice's input, uh, evaluating that at, at R, you could kind of think of that as like a random fingerprint of, of Alice's input X, and and Bob then um, computes, you know, the analogous fingerprint of his input and just compares the two fingerprints, and the term fingerprint comes because we think of fingerprints as sort of an almost unique identifier. So if their inputs were not the same, like they have to get very unlucky for their fingerprints to match. But if their fingerprints are the same, then obviously if you, you know, take the same person's fingerprint twice, you get the same thing out both times. Is fingerprinting the low degree extension basically? Yeah, so it's, a, um, uh, there are a number of ways you can do fingerprinting um, and, and, one way, so I, I, I think we discussed, I get, you know, I always get the two sessions, the two meeting sessions mixed up, but I think we discussed uh, like Reed Solomon codes versus low degree extension. Mm -hmm. And these were just like two different ways of interpreting um, these vectors as, as degree n minus one polynomials. Um, but in both cases, um, there was just some way to interpret these vectors as degree n minus one polynomials and the fingerprint was like the evaluation of the polynomial at a, at a random point. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it turns out that, yeah, and Reed Solomon, um, the way of going from the vector to the polynomial is to view the vector as like the coefficients in the um, sort of standard monomial basis. Um, but with mm -hmm. the low degree extension, you think of it as like evaluations 
of the polynomial at some specified um, interpolation domain. So mm -hmm. uh, um, often that can just be like, you know, the first n minus one field elements, but in certain situations you'd want it to be um, another set. Um, yeah, so um, they were just different ways of, of interpreting vectors as, as polynomials. And, and then the, uh, the term fingerprinting um, could refer to, uh, it just means taking whatever polynomial comes out. It doesn't really matter which way you use and evaluating it at a random point. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so you can think here, um, and it's a little unfortunate that above I had X for Alice's input, and uh, here I have X for like the powers of R. So I don't know, maybe I'll maybe I should change that. Uh, maybe I'll call it Z now. Sorry, just just so no one gets confused that I you know re grabbed X to mean something different than before. Um, yeah, so you could think of um, multiplying the matrix C by this random vector Z as like a fingerprint of C. Now the fingerprint is not as small anymore. So um, in the communication protocol, the fingerprint was like just a single field element, the evaluation at the random point R. Now the fingerprint is like a whole vector. Um, so, you know, if C is an N by N matrix, now the fingerprint is a vector in F to the N. Um, but it's still much smaller than the original matrix. So we've kind of turned an n by n matrix, we've kind of compressed it, if you will, um, into a length n vector. So it's still, you know, it's square root the size of the matrix. So it's still much smaller. Um, and similarly, we think of A times B uh, times Z as a, as a fingerprint uh, of A times B, which is the true answer. And we're just going to compare the two fingerprints. Um, now, I will formally analyze uh, the probability you get like a collision where C and A times B are not the same matrices, and yet their fingerprints match. So I will come back to that and formally analyze it um, shortly. But intuitively, you know, it should it should be the case because I'm describing these as fingerprints that if C and A times B are not the same matrix, their fingerprints will disagree with overwhelming probability. Uh, whereas, obviously, if they are the same matrix, the fingerprints will, will always agree, uh, regardless of the choice of Z. Um, and then in terms of saving the verifier time relative to computing A times B from scratch, the key point is uh, associativity of like matrix multiplication and matrix vector multiplication because um, A times B times Z um, is the same as A times B times Z. So rather than doing the very expensive matrix matrix malt, um, which takes super linear time according to the fastest known algorithms, instead, um, so this would be matrix matrix malt, and then you take the result and do, you know, multiply, that's one matrix you multiply by vector. Uh, that'd be the expensive way of doing things. Instead, we can just do two matrix vector malts. So this is a matrix vector malt. Uh, the result is then a vector. So then uh, to get the final result, you do a second matrix vector mod, you know, A times the result, the vector resulting from B times Z. So we've kind of reduced the hard work of computing A times B from scratch to the much easier work of just doing two matrix vector multiplications. Each matrix vector multiplication um, can be done in time, um, linear time in the size of the input. Right. Um, it might help for me to explain that real, real quickly, even though um, for some of you, I'm sure it, it's clear, but just, just in case um, a quick explanation would be helpful. So um, I guess if this is your matrix B, and this is your vector Z, I guess I should draw it as a column vector, right? So um, the first entry of the results um, is just the dot product of you know the first row of B and the vector. Um, so that is just uh, you know remember that everything has length n here. Um, so that's just uh, n multiplications and n additions. So you can get the first answer, the, the first entry of the answer in um, order n field operations. You know n multiplications and n additions. Um, Right, um, and and so yeah, and the same thing just happens entry by entry, right? So like the second entry of the answer, you just take the dot product of the second row of the matrix and and the vector. Um, so e each each entry of the answer can be had 
can be computed with order n field operations. Um, so in total, that's n, you know, n times order n field operations, which is order n squared field operations. And that's time linear in um, the size of the matrix B. Um, so up to constant factors, um, you know, the verifier computing, um, you know, a, uh, the two matrix vector multiplications that it needs to get A times B times Z um, is no more expensive than what's required to just read the inputs in the first place, right? Because even just reading one of these matrices takes n squared time. Okay, so that is the whole protocol. Now, I do obviously need to explain to you that the probability um, that you get kind of a fingerprint collision if C and A times D are not the same matrix is small. Um, so I will do that momentarily, but let me just pause and see if anyone wants to ask a question. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, why why can't you evaluate uh, the fingerprint of C at C times Z of R instead of just C times Z? And then the length of the fingerprint would, would just be one field element instead of a vector of field elements. Uh, good. So you're, you're saying um, what if rather than having the fingerprint be C times Z, what if we had, I don't know, maybe another random vector here, call it V, and looked at, um, at this? Um, and similarly, so you're saying like define this to be the fingerprint to C and this to be the fingerprint of A times B, and that's just one field element? Or e even simpler, instead of C times the vector Z, mm -hmm. why not just C times Z evaluated at some ran another random value uh, A or B? Z, well, Z, Z is just a vector containing powers of, of the random field element R here. So I guess I'm not sure what you mean by Z evaluated at something. Z is a vector. Right. Can we choose another f random element, call it A within the finite field, and then evaluate uh -huh. C or evaluate Z at this random element and multiply by C? Well, um, so I guess so. So Z has uh, n, n entries. So I guess I'm not, it's just a vector with n entries. So I guess I'm not sure what it means to evaluate Z at a random element. I think, well, I guess what you surely mean then is then interpret, you're saying interpret. Z as a polynomial, um, I don't know, PZ, and replace it, uh, and then, um, yeah, evaluate that at some random point, A. Um, that, yeah. that is... Yeah. I guess, yeah, PZ evaluated at some value A. Yeah. Um, so then you're, so, so Z, you know, is sort of, okay, it's powers of R, but R is random. Think of Z as just a totally random vector. So if you, if this is a fingerprint of Z, you're sort of fingerprinting a random vector. I mean, what's going to come out is just a random field element. Um, so it's at that point. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe the issue with the proposal is just that C, C times a single field element. Um, is still it's not compressing like it's it's just as big as the itself like c itself like if you take a matrix and you multiply it by uh just a single field element what comes out is a matrix but if you were to multiply it by a vector what comes out is a vector so that's compressing but this isn't maybe is that yeah yeah that makes sense that i i was just thinking if we if we can compress the, the fingerprints of c and a times b mm. to just single field el field elements yeah, so you can, and but I think this is the natural way to do it, is to just take the fingerprints I described and basically fingerprint those fingerprints, right? Those fingerprints are vectors, and I told you in the communication protocol how to fingerprint a vector. You know, you like interpret it as polynomial and evaluate at a random point. By the way, this is kind of another way of fingerprinting a vector is just to take a, another like completely random vector and, you know, take the dot product of the two vectors. but um, if you chose V to have to not be completely random, but instead to be structured in the same way Z is, meaning it's all powers of some random field element, that is literally the same as like Reed, Reed Solomon fingerprinting. <laughs> um, that was probably a lot to follow. But um, anyway, coming back to the suggestion, yeah. So this would work. This would work. Um, rather than saying compare, you know, CZ to A times BZ, um, you could, you know, multiply each of these 
you could fingerprint each of these um, by multiplying on the left by a uh, ran, you know, random vector V or you know, a vector that's powers of a different field element, different random field element. Uh, either way works. Um, the, if you only care about verifier time, um, it doesn't really help, right? Because um, what I described already had linear verifier time. And if anything, this kind of adds an extra two you know, uh, inner products to be computed by the verifier. Um, but, uh, there actually are like space benefits for the ver space benefits. So, um, there, people will consider models like where, um, these input matrices are like the verifier is able to make like one pass over one streaming pass over the matrix or something. So, you know, um, you think the matrix is like laid out in memory and the verifier is going to read the matrix from start to finish. Uh, just once and like doesn't want to have to read it a second time or something like that. And there are actually space benefits to doing it this way, um, the way you're ultimately proposing. Um, and th there's a protocol called uh, by Kimbrell and Sinha uh, from like 1990, uh, which does exactly this. So the answer is, uh, yeah, we could have defined the fingerprints to be just one field element by essentially taking these vector valued fingerprints and fingerprinting them uh, but it wouldn't actually wind up saving the verifier any time. Um, it would potentially benefit other costs of the verifier in certain settings. Uh, was that sufficiently clear? Yeah, sweet. That that makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, just, just, yes. Justin, um, why do we need the vector Z to be made up of powers of R and not just a random N element? I mean, vector of right. N elements. Right. Yeah, we, we don't. So a, a random n element vector would work fine. Um, we're about to see why I chose it to be powers of R. Um, it's so that I can sort of directly reduce to um, Reed-Solomon fingerprinting, which we already discussed. Um, so actually, uh, there are pros and cons to the two approaches. So Freeval's or original algorithm, by the way, was what you just proposed, so a completely random vector. Um, the benefit of Freevolds, so uh, completely random vector rather than powers of R, is that the error probability, so the probability of outputting the wrong answer, uh, which is the same as like a fingerprint collision, is at most just one over the field size. Whereas um, with, um, with my, my proposal powers of R, rather than a truly random vector, this probability is actually um, up to, but no larger than n minus one over field size. Um, and, you know, actually in, in SNARKs today, people are pushing towards working over smaller fields for performance reasons. So in that situation, you might actually care about this difference. Um, but uh, a benefit of my proposal, other than, I mean, I, I'm really doing it just to sort of directly reduce to um, the situation we already saw in the communication protocol, but is just that, um, you know, there's verifier, um, only, I don't know, let me put it this way. I, you know, the verifier only had to pick one random field element to specify the vector. So, so Z is, you know, fully specified by a single random field element R. So if you like really care about verifier space or something like this could be nicer. It doesn't have to you know, store an entire, your complete random vector, something like that. Oh, okay. Um, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, really, I, I did it just so that the um, error analysis becomes identical to last time, to the communication protocol. Okay. Is it minus, yeah, is it N minus one... Is that the length of the vector Z? Yeah, it's, these are n by n matrices, A, B, C. And so Z has length n. And so this is n minus one. And the point here is, you know, a vector of length n, we're, you know, going to think of it as like the coefficients or something of a degree n minus one polynomial. And uh, you, you, the error probability is always like degree over field size. So that's where N minus one mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? 
Uh, how, how does Free Vault uh, compare to uh, Strassen's algorithm? Yeah, so Strassen's algorithm um, is, is an algorithm. Um, it's an efficient algorithm, um, the kind of the first interesting algorithm for computing from scratch A times B. Um, so the totally trivial algorithm runs in time n cubed. And Strassen's algorithm runs in time like n to the 2.8 or something. So it's a little better than n cubed. Um, in fact, it's still used in practice because once you sort of get asymptotically better than Strassen's, you kind of concretely actually get worse because the hidden constants get much worse and stuff like that. Um, so Strassen's is about computing A times B from scratch. Freevald's is about uh, you imagine someone hands you A times B and your goal is just to confirm that, in fact, it's correct. Freevald checks that C equals A times B. But it's, uh, it's, it's vastly faster than computing A times B from scratch. So free volumes runs in time order n squared instead of order n to the 2.8 or something like that. Does that make sense? It does. Thanks. Cool, yeah. Um, we'll talk when I get to interactive proofs, which is we get to quickly in Chapter 4. Um, I'll talk about how, um, you know, I think the real goal in snark design, which is very difficult to achieve, but you can actually do it with things like matrix multiplication, is to have the prover uh, compute the right answer like any way it wants, say running the fastest known algorithm for it. Like you just don't care where the answer came from. If, you know, some alien handed the prover the answer, that would be fine. Um, and then do a low order amount of work, say, uh, you know, order input size. Um, so if the, I don't know, n squared, if we're talking about matrix multiplication, um, work to prove the answer is correct. And, and Freevaud sort of, um, achieves this even without um, order n squared, because with free VODs, the prover just sends the right answer. There is no extra work for the prover. Um, but with interactive proofs, we can, we'll see settings where actually the verifier doesn't really need to know the product matrix. It only needs to know like a little bit of information about the product matrix, and then you can avoid actually sending the whole pro uh, product matrix to the verifier. Um, but the key point is that like most SNARKs, like the SNARKs everyone's using today, they will basically force the prover to prove that it like ran a specific algorithm um, to either compute the right answer from scratch or at least to verify that the right answer was correct. Um, and I think the ideal is to, the verifier shouldn't care what algorithm the prover used in its head. All it cares about is that the answer is correct. So um, it should be possible to have the prover prove that the answer is correct without, um, proving the potentially more complicated to prove statement that the answer not only is it correct, but like the prover checked its correctness or computed it uh, from scratch in a very specific way. Um, and that is the difference between sort of um, like a constant factor overhead for the prover relative to computing the right answer and a low order additive amount of extra work. Anyway, so um, Freevold's algorithm, like we're seeing it now, and it seems like super simple, like so simple, like it's almost not even worth discussing. But it's, it's actually pretty unique in that the prover, like to prove correctness, like does literally no extra work. And in snark land, we're like almost never gonna be in that situation. But as we'll see in chapter four, we will see some situations uh, with not surprisingly matrix multiplication being one of them where we can achieve this sort of thing, where the prover computes the right answer anyway. Once Strassen's algorithm, an alien hands it, you know, beams the answer down to the prover somehow from space. And then the prover does just does a, a, a teeny, teeny, like negligible amount of extra work to prove that the answer is correct. Yeah, so free volumes, while simple and seemingly almost trivial, like kind of has amazing properties for the prover that we almost never achieve in Snarkland. Um, the prover like basically does no extra work at all to prove correctness. Hey, okay, so yeah, so uh, sorry for the ra rambling outside there um, all right um okay so i've told you how free works um 
And I've explained why the verifier runs in linear time. Basically, it just has to do three matrix vector multiplications, one to compute C times Z, one to compute B times Z, and one to multiply the result by A. Um, so that's just three matrix vector multiplications. So that's linear time, order n squared time. So what I need to sh explain now is that uh, the correctness. So, you know, one is obvious. So if C actually equals A times B, then, you know, with probability one over the choice of Z, it will, you know, so it'll always be the case that when you multiply, you know, when you compute their fingerprints, they're, they're the same. Um, so the algorithm always does the right thing if the answer is, you know, the two matrices are equal. So the complicated thing is what if C does not equal A times B? And here is where I'm going to tell you, uh, show that CZ does not equal A times B times Z um, with probability um, at least 1 minus N minus 1 over field size. And here this probability is over the random choice of R that then defines uh, Z. So the R such that um, Z equals, um, you know, all powers of R up to N minus one. I ran out of room there, but yeah. All right, hopefully, you, sorry, you get the idea. Um, so basically this is the probability N minus one over field size of them sort of, um, of the fingerprints matching, even though uh, you're fingerprinting two different matrices. Um, that's the only situation when the algorithm makes an error. Okay, so here's how to see this. Um, so let's just look at like a single row of um, the matrix. So let's call the first row of C, C1, you know, the second row of C, C2, down to Cn. Um, and so C times Z um, is just, um, remember Z is R to the zero, R to the one, uh, R to the N minus one. Um, so C like the first entry of the matrix C times this vector uh, Z is just, um, well, what it is, it's the Reed Solomon fingerprint of C1, right? So what's happening here is this, the, the inner product between C1 and Z is just, it's the same as interpreting C1 as, you know, the list of coefficients of a degree N minus one polynomial and evaluating at R. Right, because it's you know sum from i equals zero to n minus one of c one comma i times r to the i. Right, so that is yeah the the first entry of the fingerprint of the matrix C is simply the Reed Solomon fingerprint of the first row of C. Right, so what that means is C times Z is just um, this vector uh, of whose ith entry is the Reed Solomon fingerprint of uh, row i of c. Um, and so all that's happening is, you know, if, so if, if c, uh, if the matrix c is not the same matrix as a times b, you know, that just means that there is at least one row. Uh, let me call it row i, uh, such that the ith row of C is not the same as the ith row of A times B, right? And then, um, you know, C, that means that, you know, remember the, the ith entry of C times Z um, is, is just, uh, as I just said, the Reed Solomon fingerprint. Of CI. And similarly, the ith entry of A times B times Z um, is the Reed Solomon fingerprint of uh, the ith row of, of A times B. And so, um, yeah, all, basically, all we're doing here is uh, we're doing row by row Reed Solomon fingerprinting of C and A times B. And we saw that if you, you know, so if, if C and A times B are not the same matrix, they differ in at least one row, which means, you know, if you just focus on that row, so you look at that, the corresponding entry of the fingerprint, um, of the matrix fingerprint, 
um, you know, we're taking that entry is the Reed Solomon fingerprint of two different vectors. And we saw that, you know, if you take two different vectors, CI and A times BI, so the I throw of C and the I throw of A times B, and they're not the same vector, and you read Solomon fingerprint them, the probability that uh, their read Solomon fingerprints agree is at most um, N minus one over field size. Yeah. So um, in this sort of um, variant of free vault algorithm, um, the algorithm is just doing row by row read Solomon fingerprinting of the matrices. So if they're not the same matrix, you wind up, um, at, you know, you, at, at least one of those read Solomon fingerprints is the read Solomon fingerprint of two different vectors. And that's, that's it. That's the whole, whole analysis of the protocol. Um, I feel like I might not have explained it that well. Uh, so maybe I'll see if anyone wants to ask a question, if that didn't come across clearly enough. Just a quick clarification. When we say read Solomon fingerprint, mm -hmm. we're doing, um, let's just take one, like C1. Yeah. yeah. And then we have, I mean, if you could scroll up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, Here. right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Z. Yeah. Z is, um, like you said before, just, I guess we're calling it the uh, read Solomon because we're just grabbing a random value R. And yeah, the, the because outcome, of, I took, oh, sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say the outcome is a single scalar value. Yeah, if you just focus on this row, you know, uh, inner product with Z, which is the first entry of the, you know, of CZ, if you, uh, if you just look at the first entry. Um, so yeah, we're comparing, I, yeah, and I can think I can maybe clarify my question. Okay. So, so we're just comparing. Um, basically, this uh, all the values in this output one dimensional matrix, and if any of them conflict, then we know because there's a scale. There's scalar values that come out the other side. Yeah. So well. So 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 z, c times z is a vector, and so is a times b times z, yeah. and so wind up computing two vectors, each of length n, and then, yeah, you have to go, like, entry by entry through the two vectors and compare them, right? So if, yeah. if here's your first vector and here's your second vector, you have to, like, compare the first entry and see if they're equal, compare the second entry, see if they're equal, compare the third entry, see if they're equal. Um, and if you ever find, um, you know, uh, an, an entry j such that the jth entry of tz does not equal the jth entry of a times b times z, then you say, hey, I know that C and A times B were not the same matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, thanks for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did not present this so clear. I, I don't have the right, the best possible picture here for sure. I think uh, maybe it'd be easy. It'd be best to just, just quickly say, like, you know, let's just imagine that C, the matrix C and the matrix A times B differ in at least one entry of their first row. Um, so, you know, then I can just draw the first row. So here's, here's the first row of, of the matrix C. I'm going to call it, uh, C1. Um, so C1, zero up to C1, N minus one. Um, and let me just, here's C1i. And let's say, um, uh, well, let's look at the first row of A times B. Uh, let me call that, I don't know, D, D zero up to, uh, dn minus one and so yeah so so this is this is the first row of c this is the first row of a times b which the verifier doesn't actually know because that would require uh sort of computing the first row of a times b explicitly which doesn't want to do but let's just say that um these two rows happen to differ in in one entry um so if you you know what the what the free vault verifier actually does is just winds up taking the dot product of each of these rows with, with Z, which is just powers of R, um, you know, for both of them. And, and that's just, again, that's just interpreting each as a degree N minus one polynomial and evaluating that polynomial at R. Um, and so, yeah, you wind up, if you, if you just sort of focus on these two rows where there was a 
difference between the two rows um, and you only look at like that entry of the resulting fingerprint, you're just comparing that you wind up looking at the Reed Solomon fingerprint um, of two different vectors, two vectors that are not the same vector because they, they differ, you know, mm -hmm. that it, uh, they're two polynomials. They, you interpret them as two polynomials oh. that differ, at least in this coefficient. Yeah. So they're mm -hmm. very unlikely to collide. Yeah. Can you just, Justin? yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, just for a sanity check for me, what, what makes it uh, read Solomon code is the fact that um, where um, Z is powers of R, right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that's what kind of, you know, if, if I think you said this before, but if it was like just uh, a bunch of random R's in a vector, then it wouldn't be considered the read Solomon code. Is that that's that's right. Yeah, it, it it would actually be something related called. Would you even call it that? Yeah, it wouldn't be Reed Solomon. I'll leave it at that. Um, in fact, um, yeah, I guess uh, I might jump ahead to a technical lemma from Chapter Three once we're done discussing this. Uh, I'll tell you exactly how to interpret mm -hmm. Freevod's protocol in terms of polynomials. But yeah, what's making it a Reed Solomon um, fingerprint is exactly what you said, that it's, it's powers of R instead of just random, random entries of the vector. If they were, if they were just totally random entries, uh, you'd wind up basically rather than having a univariate polynomial evaluated at R, you'd have a uh, n variate function evaluated at a random input. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how to think about that momentarily. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, so that was that was a uh, the main actually that was the main reason to, like I guess in the book, um, to use powers of R here was um, if I wanted to actually analyze Freevald's algorithm in like the cleanest way, I'd have to tell you something called the Short Zippel lemma. I don't, you know, uh, you can analyze Freevald's without the full power of the Short Zippel lemma, but I think uh, the Short Zippel lemma is like kind of the nicest way to conceptualize it, which is a statement about uh, multivariate polynomials. And it seemed better to just get through free vault algorithm without getting into multivariate polynomials to stick with univariate polynomials, um, at least through the end of um, chapter two. Yeah, so great question. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. Other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, why don't I just jump ahead to the short Zippel lemma, um, which is, I think, covered sort of buried in the middle of chapter three. Um, but since we um, just got a question about um, Freevold's algorithm itself, which involves n variant um, functions, sort of a natural segue into the short Zippel lemma. So um, the short Zippel lemma is kind of a multivariate analog of the statements um, that we used to analyze the communication fingerprinting protocol um where that statement was for univariate polynomials of degree at most n minus one um let me just call them p and q and say they're not the same polynomial uh the probability that um p of r equals q of r uh, where the probability is over the random choice of r in the field um, is at most n minus one over field size. So short Zippel is a multivariate generalization of that. Um, so now um, P and Q will be, uh, I don't know, let's call them L variate polynomials. Um, P of X1 up to XL, Q of X1 up to XL. And we have to briefly discuss like what is um, the right notion of degree of for multivariate polynomials. Um, let me just give an example of a multivariate polynomial. So you might have like x1 squared times x2 times x3 plus x2 cubed plus x1 times x3. I don't know. So this would be an example of a three variate polynomial. Okay. And um, the total degree would be um, uh, you go over each monomial and you add up the degrees of each term. So this would be like two plus one plus one. And that would give you, you know, like the degree of this term would be four because you got power two, power one, power one. 
the degree of this term would be three because we have a single power three, and the degree of this term would be two because we have you know two powers of one. And the total degree um, of p would just be the max um, max degree of any of any monomial. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so what the short zip lemma says is let P and Q um, be distinct um, de total degree at most D polynomials um, and over any number of variables. So let's say over L variables. Um, you know, in, in, in the snarks we're going to see to begin with, think of L might be 30 or 60 or something. Um, so what the short zip lemma says is if you pick, um, a random, um, R in field to the L, right? So, you know, the R is now a vector of L field, field elements, you know, to evaluate an l varied polynomial at a point, that point has to have L entries. Um, so the probability over R that P of R equals Q of R is at most the total degree, which I call D over field size. Okay, so it's just like the straightforward generalization um, of the univariate polynomial statement we saw before um, to multivariate, where just degree is replaced with total degree. That's short zippel. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So short zippel tells you that um, you know this interpreting um, like vectors as even multivariate polynomials, so not just univariate ones like in Reed Solomon, is a distance amplifying encoding. So if two vectors disagree in even a single point, and then you interpret both vectors somehow as multivariate polynomials um, of you know not very large total degree, um, they will disagree at almost all evaluations. Um, so it's just, it, it turns even a single difference in vectors into um, almost complete difference once interpreted as polynomials and, you know, sort of um, looking at um, where their evaluations agree. Okay, so then coming back to Freevald's algorithm, um, if I, yeah, so if, if I just said let X be a random vector in field to the n, and I define the fingerprint of c to be c times x, and the fingerprint of a times b to be a times b times x. Um, so it's the same. Um, the algorithm is the same. We just changed what, what vector we were using to do the fingerprints. Uh, rather than powers of a single random field element R, that's now just a completely random vector. Um, the runtime of the algorithm is still linear, right? Because it's just, again, three matrix vector multiplications and, you know, a bunch of equality checks or whatever. Um, so what about the error analysis? And, and basically what's happening now is rather than doing the Reed-Solomon fingerprint of each row, and um, yeah, so rather than like uh, taking the inner product of, of row one of C and powers of R, um, we're now doing it with um, entries of X, which are just completely random field, field elements. Um, and this is equivalent to, you know, I can just write that out. So sum over, you know, the entries I of each row, you know, C1I if we're looking at row one times um, XI. So what's happening here is we're interpreting each row, in this case C1, as a um, n variant polynomial of total degree one.
Um, also known as a linear function, but that's not really important right now. Um, so it's just, this is a polynomial uh, in X. It's, it has, there are N variables, X1 to Xn. Um, and the total degree is one, right? Because it's just a sum of degree one terms. Okay, so Schwartz-Zippel says that, you know, if you, you know, if, if like the first row of, of C and the first row of A times B um, differ, um, and now we evaluate, um, you know, uh, we interpret them both as, as distinct total degree one functions and then variables and evaluate them both at the same randomly chosen point, uh, the probability that, you know, C, C1, I don't know what notation to use now, um, whatever, C1 dot product X equals the first row of A times B dot product X, um, is, you know, when I hear the probabilities over the choice of X is at most uh, one over field size, because it's, it's general, it's total degree over field size. Um, so that's, that was a benefit of, of doing things this way that I mentioned before, is the error probability falls from n minus one over field size down to one over field size. And the key point here is by using multivariate polynomials, um, n variate, instead of univariate, we were able to reduce the degree, the total degree from n minus one down to one. Um, this is actually the power, this is the key power, which we're gonna see much more starkly as we go into interactive proofs. This is the key power of uh, multivariate polynomials um, in interactive proofs. So, so Freevolds is not an interactive proof. It's, it's a randomized proof system because the verifier is randomized, but it's not interactive because the prover just you know, sends the claim to answer the verifier and that's it. There's no like, uh, you know, uh, conversation that the prover and verifier have, uh, you know, random challenge response, random challenge response. Um, but even when we go to interactive protocols, what we'll see is that, um, you know, n, like n variant functions um, can um, sort of encode, I mean, maybe let me try to say it a different way. Um, we can interpret, let me, let me say it this way. We, we can interpret uh, a vector um, uh, let me say a in field to the n um, as a multivariate function um, of much lower total degree than if we interpret it as um, a univariate polynomial. Right. So, like, just to have uh, like an injective mapping from length n vectors to univariate polynomials, uh, you need the degree of the univariate polynomial to be at least n minus one. So you just, you're stuck with degree at least n minus one. Um, whereas if you allow the polynomial to have many variables, um, the degree can be, the total degree can be much smaller, right? So we just saw in Freevolds, you can, if you allow uh, n variables, which is sort of the most that makes sense, you can have the total degree be all the way down to one. But even if you only allow log n variables, which is like a much smaller number of variables than n, um, log n variables, uh, you can keep the total degree um, to log n, um, something like that. Um, and that's sort of exactly the where the, the power of multivariate polynomials come from, because we'll see that interactive proofs can have costs that scale with the total degree of the polynomial and not, um, so I'll just leave it at that, yeah. So if you can have the total degree be um, much, much, much smaller than N, uh, you can have like better costs in the interactive proof than if you used a univariate polynomial, which would necessitate degree N. Um, then there are a lot of snarks based on univariate polynomials. And in my view, which is sort of a personal view, but I think there's something to it, they kind of bring in a lot of cryptography to overcome this 
uh, downside <laughs> of univariate polynomials. And I think that's why, you know, at very high level, you can think of snarks derived from interactive proofs as um, they tend to be faster for the prover, although they, they can also have slightly higher verification costs. Um, but the reason they tend to be faster for the prover is because they can minimize the use of cryptography, which is expensive for the prover. Uh, the univariate techniques have to use a lot of cryptography to kind of bring the same sort of costs to bear on the protocol that you would get from having low total degree while not having low total degree because the univariate degree would be at least n minus one. This won't make much sense uh, till later, but what, what we did see here was just that by using n variate polynomials instead of univariate, we were able to keep the total degree lower, which uh, didn't really speed up the prover or the verifier or anything, but did lower the failure probability from n minus one over field size to one over field size. So it bought, it did buy something. Okay. I have a question on that. Yeah, please. Um, so that in, in practice, that improvement from n minus one to one, um, is that substantial? Because isn't the field size a lot larger than n? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Um, so typically, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, people are getting um, trying to make the field smaller and smaller for performance reasons. Um, but just because, you know, if you have a 50 bit field, then like a field multiplication can be like just 10 times faster than if you have a 256 bit field. Um, so yeah, I mean, you see this a lot, especially in, in snarks that use, use fry, um, because okay, I mean, basically, okay. So today fry is like the main, the main, um, polynomial commitment scheme that people use that is not based on elliptic curves. Uh, that's why fry is plausibly post-quantum and everything else people are using is, is not, we do have other plausibly post-quantum things. They just tend to have somewhat bigger proofs than fry. Um, so people wind up using Fry. Uh, yeah, so if you're using elliptic curves, you have to work over a big field because the elliptic curve needs a big field to be secure. If you're using Fry, you don't fundamentally have to be over a big field. Um, now, yeah, so, so people like to use, uh, uh, you know, a particularly popular field right now is the Goldilocks field. It's of size about two to the 64. And um, failure probability even of one over two to the 64 um, is, is not cryptographically small. Um, so yeah, quick note, like, yeah, the difference between like, if N is two to the 20, which is actually fairly small N in practice, you know, th this difference matters, right? Like this is like 64 bits of security. You know, uh, it, it, I, I won't get into too much detail about what that means now, but like, uh, yeah, the, anyway, um, whereas, uh, like two to the 20 over two to the 64 would only be about 44 bits of security. Like that's a, a, you know, a 20 bit difference in security is, is significant. Uh, you know, the difference between 100 bits of security and 80 bits of security is the difference between something where an attack is feasible and something where uh, it's uh, not feasible today. Um, so yeah, so as people sort of get aggressively working over smaller fields, um, these differences might matter a lot more. Um, now, let me just quickly say uh, this bit of a tangent, but what people do, given that even one over two to the 64 is not small enough failure probability. Um, so with Fry in particular, um, the prover sort of runs in two, two phases, if you will. So, okay, the first phase is, okay, so it, it has this polynomial it wants to commit and um, it, it basically, the, first, the very first thing it does is uh, take the low degree extension encoding of the polynomial. Okay, uh, let's not worry too much about um, what this, you know, how this initial vector corresponds. It's literally the low degree. So you interpret um, this vector is is like the evaluate if it's a degree n polynomial. This is the evaluations of the polynomial at um, n specified input points. And in Fry, the first thing the prover has to do is um, evaluate that polynomial at um, many more input points. So say, I don't know, rather than n, it has to evaluate it at, at four n input points, okay? And, and that is um, the, the most expensive thing the prover does. 
um, is just uh, what we call multi-point interpolation, also known as like taking the little Greek extension encoding. Um, you, you take this polynomial uh, specified via its evaluations at endpoints and you evaluate it at a bunch more points. Is that the blow up factor? Yeah, this four is the blow up factor. So this blow up factor could be anywhere from two to in practice, people go even up to like 32 or something sometimes. But yeah, this means like 32 would be like a real slow prover. Yeah. Um, two would be a fast prover, but then like your proof would be really, really big. Um, so anyway, yeah. So uh, and then what the what the Fry prover does, the committer, is it just Merkle hashes this thing. So the commitment to the polynomial is just like the Merkle hash of this thing. If you don't know what Merkle hashing is, don't worry. We're going to come to all this later. Um, by the way, I uh, yeah, I, a lecture I recorded on Fry should be available in the ZK Learning MOOC uh, real soon. So just if you're curious, uh, I feel like I'm just, yeah, uh, repeating what I just said recently, but no one was around for it since it was just a recording. So um, anyway, and then... Um, yeah, that, a, after that, after after the commitment is sent, there's something that I call the folding phase. Uh, I won't go into the you Basically, I don't know. It's a log round protocol, logarithmic rounds, where in each round, um, the verifier sends a random field element to the prover, and the prover is supposed to kind of take this big vector and and uh, kind of split it in half. And you think of it as as folding the two halves. Uh, what that really means is take a random linear combination of the two halves where the randomness was supplied by the verifier when I said the verifier sends a random field element. So uh, the details don't really matter, but you know, um, you, so, so after the first fold, the vector goes from length 4n to 2n. After the second fold, it goes from 2n to n. And you just keep folding, 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 folding. Um, and, and each fold, I don't know, eventually you stop folding and the verifier does some checks and, and everything's done. Okay, so back to this question about small fields. So, um, it turns out that uh, you can, the soundness error of Fry has two components. Um, and one looks roughly like uh, the degree of the polynomial, because the univariate polynomial, so I can just write degree, and that's unambiguous, over the field size, um, plus uh, some other term, let's say. Uh, I'll just say some other term. OK, and, and this thing. This thing is is like the probability uh, that um, the prover gets a lucky fold. So the prover gets like lucky in the folding phase. Phase. What that means is um, it starts. You know, it's a line prover, so it starts with like a vector that you know is supposed to be all evaluations of a degree n polynomial at these you know four n inputs, but in fact is is not a degree n polynomial evaluate those four n inputs. It's just some like, you know, very high degree thing that's like degree up to four n evaluated at those four n inputs. A lucky fold would be a fold where when that vector gets split in half and the two halves get randomly combined, the resulting folded thing is lower degree, much lower degree than the thing that got folded. So the prover, the line prover started with a high degree thing like degree four n, but after the fold, the thing looked like it came from a low degree thing. Um, okay, and and so what? In order to make sure th this term is small, um, you need the field to be big, and this is really the only reason you would ever like. You really need the field to be big in Fry. So need field to be big, so this term is small, All right? So to keep the prover from getting lucky in the folding phase, uh, you need the field to be big. Intuitively, if the prover was able to kind of like I don't know guess. Uh, what the random linear combination of the two halves of its, you know, committed vector that the verifier would ask for. Um, it could sort of arrange to have committed to something very high degree, but like it guessed in advance, like what the random fold would be. So, you know, it, it arranged so that after the fold, it, uh, it looks low degree, even though it's not, uh, or it wasn't. Um, so you really need the field to be big so that the prover doesn't have a good chance of guessing in advance what the, you know, randomness in the folding procedure would be. OK, so what people will do is um, they will work over a small field, which ensures that all of the field operations um, during this um, encoding phase, which is the most expensive thing for the prover when it does this multipoint interpolation, are fast because the field it's working on is small. OK, but then when the folding comes, they work over an extension field. 
So um, we didn't discuss last time what is an extension field, but it's kind of a way to um, embed. Uh, so, so like a, a degree three, if you have a, a prime field F of, of, you know, size some prime P, like a degree K extension field would have size uh, like P to the K. Um, and and so it's a way to embed like a small field in a larger field of uh, you know where you kind of raise the field size to the kth power. So think of k as two uh, as two or three or four or something like that. Uh, so you can go from like a 64-bit field and embed it in a 128-bit field or 196-bit field or something. So that's what people wind up doing a lot today, right? Is they'll they'll work over what they call the base field, the field of size only like about two to 64, the Goldilocks field or something. That ensures that this multipoint interpolation, which is the main expense for the prover, all happens in the base field where everything is nice and fast. But then when they go to do the folding procedure, the random field elements the verifier is sending to the prover to do the fold will come from the extension field. And now from that point on, all the field arithmetic is pretty expensive because um, it happens in the much bigger field, the degree two or three extension field. But it doesn't really matter because um, uh, all the total work done in the folding phase for the prover is like order n, while the work done in the uh, multipoint interpolation phase was n log n, right? So the idea is that, um, you know, even if each individual uh, operation is cheaper because you worked over the base field in the interpolation, multipoint interpolation phase, um, you know, n log n ops over the base field, the small field, should still be the dominant cost relative to order n operations over like the degree two or three extension field. Um, so that's that is the main scenario where small fields are getting used today. Um, again, they're doing it to make these multi-point interpolations as fast as possible, um, and then moving to a bigger field, um, an extension field for the rest of Fry. And yeah, um, in uh, uh, so it's it's a little hard to say, you know, if if the failure probably if they if if they wind up doing the folds in the extension field, so that field is pretty big, then it it wouldn't matter too much if you lose the n minus uh, one. I think of that as losing like twenty bits of security or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it just depends just how aggressive they're getting with field size, right? Like I think some of these projects, in fact, a lot of them. Um, I think risk zero polygon. I think they're, 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 the extension fields they're using are like 128 bits, um, maybe even a little less, 120 bits, and they're targeting 100 bits of security, uh, so they can afford to lose like 20 bits uh, compared to one over field size, but they can't lose anything more than that, or they'll fall below 100 bits of security. Okay, that was one of the. You didn't even ask about this stuff, and I just went on like a 15 minute tangent, but I. I <laughs> All right, makes sense. Yeah, I have a quick follow up for that. So, mm -hmm. like in the context of Fry, mm -hmm. like how, how does using multilinear uh, polynomials um, lower the cost? Because don't you have to uh, convert it to a univariate polynomial before you run Fry anyway? Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, if you want a multivariate polynomial commitment scheme based on Fry. There does have to be some transformation. Fry itself applies only to univariate, so you have to do some kind of some kind of transformation conceptually from a multivariate to a univariate one. And these things are possible. Um, the history is basically a paper called Virgo that had like a very high overhead transformation. Um, I won't. I, I, yeah, I won't go into details of how, how it was done. Um, but I think it really does add noticeable concrete, you know, cost to the prover. Um, basically, the univariate polynomial that you wind up applying Fry to is like significantly bigger than, you know, by a constant factor, but still bigger. Than, I don't know. There's just a lot of extra stuff the prover has to do because of the overhead of the transformation. There's a much newer paper called Gemini, um, which it's sort of buried in Gemini because it's really not at all like the positioning of Gemini that gives a much um simpler lower overhead transformation um i need to actually look more carefully at that overhead but i i think you know fry itself has like 
security, you know, roughly security parameter times log squared of like the degree of the polynomial size proofs. Um, so pretty big proofs. I mean, in concretely like 200 kilobytes or more, uh, depending on how aggressive with security you're getting. Um, and so if you get very aggressive, it'd be 100 kilobytes, but I think that's too aggressive. But anyway, um, and I think this Gemini transformation um, only adds like um, additive, I think, order log n, um, like I think uh, Merkel hashes. I don't know. Um, I, I have to look at it again, but I think Merkel hashes to the to the proof. I need to look at it more closely. But anyway, um, my point is that um, you're totally right. Fry uh, directly applies on univariate polynomials. There are transformations known to kind of, you know, force a multivariate polynomial into the univariate polynomial, um, uh, you, know, pe you know, peg into the hole or whatever. Um, and they used to add in quite a bit of overhead. And I think um, the Gemini transformation is really not so, so bad overhead anymore. Um, was that, was that helpful? So, so that means you, you, so, so now you can, uh, use a multivariate polynomial based snark. Uh, you know, let me say polynomial IOP or whatever. And then, um, fry as the poly commit. Uh, you just you do have to go through so you can kind of get the benefits of the multivariate uh, techniques in the IOP and then Fry as the poly commit, even though Fry is specific to univariate polynomials, you do have to do some kind of transformation to fit your multivariate peg into the univariate hole that I'm calling Fry. Um, but the transformations now don't seem so bad. I actually, there, there should be a uh, careful like this. this TBD, someone should more carefully study the overheads of the transformation. And uh, I'd be very interested to see comparative Virgo. Um, this is sort of just a student project I've actually mentioned to some students and haven't found anyone to do yet. I'd like to, I'd like to know, just the community should know. Um, but yeah. Um, so I think I, hopefully that, that answers your question. Like there, there is this disconnect. Um, you you also see this so so Fry is a uh, polynomial commitment scheme targeted at univariate polynomials. You know it's 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 known for having the shortest proofs amongst amongst plausibly post quantum, um, and, and there, there's a related there, there's a related situation with KZG commitments. Um, so KZG commitments are very specific to univariate polynomials, and there are various like generalizations known. For multivariate ones, and and this Gemini transformation actually might be um, might be de more desirable than the previous known transformations now. Um, so, but both both yeah, the, these techniques allow one to kind of take your multivariate polynomial based polynomial IOP and take your Fry or KZG that are really targeted at univariates and and put them together anyway. But there are some overheads um, to, again, put to your, <laughs> to kind of transform multivariate into univariate. Okay, uh, I hope that made, made some sense and answered the question you intended to ask and not some random one I interpreted. Oh, yeah, thank you. That was mm -hmm. perfect. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think uh, it's probably good to wrap up um, for tonight. I did not cover much of chapter three at all, which means I won't assign any new reading. Um, uh, for next week. Uh, am I free next week? Um, yeah, I think I am free next week. So yeah. Uh, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, I didn't get through as much as I thought, but I hope it was a good session anyway. Uh, if anyone wants to ask more questions, um, I'll stick around for another, you know, till nine 30. Um, but otherwise, yeah, we covered just, we, we covered free vaults. Uh, we covered Schwartz Zippel and we had some rambling discussion about, um, multivariate versus univariate polynomials and total degree and fry and KZG. Um, so yeah, hope that was a fun assortment of topics. Um, and next time, I guess we'll start diving into the definitions of interactive proofs. And we'll especially talk about, um, and it, it's probably the most, it's a little algorithms for polynomial interpolation. Um, so this is, 
basically this is for um, low degree extension codes. So this is when, you know, Reed Solomon, uh, the way I've defined it in the book says you take your vector and you interpret it as like the coefficients of a polynomial. And then it's very straightforward to evaluate that polynomial at a point. But with low degree extension codes, you want to interpret your polynomial not as like the coefficients of the polynomial, but instead as evaluations of the polynomial. And then evaluating that polynomial at a point um, is a little, you can do it as efficiently, but you have to be more clever about it. Um, and so that is an important topic for next time, polynomial interpolation. And there are both, uh, this comes in both univariate polynomial flavors and multivariate, uh, particularly multilinear. Multilinear means um, uh, degree at most one in each, in each variable. Um, so the total degree can obviously be more than one, but the degree in each individual variable uh, is at most one. Um, so like this is multilinear, but if I were to square anything, it would no longer be multilinear. Yeah, so not multilinear, multilinear. Um, so this is, we're going to discuss polynomial interpolation for these kinds of polynomials um, next week. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's more technical than anything we've discussed so far, but we have to see it early. So there's kind of no way around it. Um, so yeah, I think next week it'll be kind of definitions of interactive proofs and arguments, and then um, these polynomial interpolation algorithms. Um, and then after that, we can finally dive into interesting um, protocols like interactive proofs. Uh, I think it gets much more exciting very quickly once we get through these interpolation algorithms. Okay, so thanks, thanks so much. Uh, and again, uh, ask questions if you want, and otherwise I will see you next week. I have one more question if, if no one else uh, has one. Um, so to kind of continue, like kind of your, your thought on um, the multivariate binomial commitments, like mm -hmm. what do you see as kind of like the, uh, um, uh, the the best way to commit multivariate binomials right now mm -hmm. uh, with a polynomial commitment scheme because like I've been kind of going through and like implementing a lot of like the the book and then I got to kind of the polynomial commitment schemes and I like I just like don't know how to make a snark out of the you know what what I've done with like GKR and stuff ah uh, so yeah what, what's kind of like your your take on like um, what's the easiest way to to commit a multivariate polynomial right now yeah um so it's trade-offs galore um so if you're is your goal to get something interesting implemented as easily as possible um would that be a reasonable goal yeah i think i think my goal was to like create a uh, a snark um, and then now I kind of like I'm going back through kind of like your your, your chapter eleven and univariate mm -hmm. spec and stuff. But I was like mm -hmm. kind of wondering like there is um, just a way to kind of go from uh, you know GKR where mm -hmm. you know, where you kind of have the um, uh, the, the the one witness uh, mm -hmm. vector mm -hmm. uh, and somehow convert that to a polynomial commitment. Yeah, so I think the easiest way to go if you starting with GKR, which, you know, forces you to use multivariate polynomials um, would be Hyrax, uh, which is maybe 12.2. It's kind of the first non-trivial discrete logarithm based um, polynomial commitment. Um, and Hyrax itself is actually like the paper was like GKR plus the Hyrax poly commit. Um, and uh, the downside of Hyrax is that the verification costs um, are square root. So it's only this kind of sort of weakly succinct situation. So square root in the size of the polynomial to be committed. Um, but it's pretty simple to implement, especially if you don't care about zero knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, it should be pretty straightforward to implement that and just like combine it with GKR to get a, a snark. Just be aware that, you know, the verification, the proof size from the, just from the polynomial commitment scheme alone will be square root. So your proofs are going to be pretty big. Um, 
You know, I don't think that bulletproof is that hard to implement. Um, and that will bring the proof size down from square root to log, although the verification time will be slow. But the proof size will be small. Um, bulletproof is conceptually sort of like a, you know, Hyrax sort of, Hyrax does like kind of one big fold um of the polynomial to be committed so it views it as like root n rows of length root n and it takes like um well i don't I, you don't even have to view it as a folding procedure um it, it kind of just deals with um you know one 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 of the two dimensions at a time you know so it's sort of like uh winds up doing like a vector matrix vector multiplication so it's it's two kind of size root n um matrix vector multiplications, whereas bulletproof um, will view, rather than um, dealing with a, a two-dimensional matrix, it'll kind of deal with a log n dimensional object. And, and it, it's actually very much like Fry, um, where you have a vector of length, you know, order n, and you like uh, cut it in half and, and randomly combine the two halves over and over again. Um, so wh while it is log round, I don't think it's really that hard to, to implement, um, uh, despite it being, you know, like a multi-round protocol. Um, now if you want to apply Fiat Shamir to get the N in SNARK, that becomes a little more annoying. Um, you, yeah, you need, um, I guess you need Fiat Shamir regardless. It's just you need log, log rounds of it um, if you're doing bulletproofs. Uh, yeah, so Fiat Shamir, yeah, there are libraries for that. Um, anyway, so uh, in summary, I guess I'd suggest Hyrax or, or Bulletproof. Probably the easiest. Um, if you go the, the Fry, Fry, I think, is kind of a little annoying to implement because you need to implement FFTs to do the multipoint interpolation, um, which is, you know, um, I think a you have to decide if you're up for that. I think that's more more annoying than the group based things. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I actually did. I like I've implemented Fry. I just yeah. like I'm, I'm now I'm like really struggling, kind of converting the multivariate ah. um, nomial to the univariate. I'm like having trouble wrapping my head around kind of the. the I yeah. guess the, in the book it's like u one u two vectors. Ah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, Maybe I'll study that a little more and have more intelligent question next time or something. Okay. Well, yeah. So that transformation was basically Virgo and it hit a lot of details because they're annoying. I mean, Vir because they're annoying. I mean, like Virgo is like this complicated transformation, like more complicated than it needs to be. You, you might want to look at, okay. So um, if you've implemented Fry, uh, but now it's like, you know, you're using a multivariate, polynomial ILP, not a univariate polynomial based one. So you have this disconnect. Might want to look at the latest version of Hyperplonk. Um, they describe like Gemini transformation plus Fry because Gemini itself was like the transformation, but applied to KZG instead of Fry as a univariate thing. Um, and they, they have like an appendix on this. Um, so that might give you the cleanest description of a transformation out there. Um, the, the book is, you wouldn't want to implement Virgo from scratch. I don't think it's, it's, it's kind of gross. Um, there's an open source implementation of Virgo. Um, so you could look at that it's in C++, but I wouldn't, I don't think I'd recommend like writing that yourself. Um, all that said, if you're, if, if, if this transformation is, if you're hung up on it, um, like you've implemented univariate things, um, you don't particularly want to implement, uh, you know, Hyrax or Bulletproofs, um, but you're hung up on this transformation. You you could go and implement the the univariate sum check things. You could do Marlin, like Marlin plus Fry or KZG. Um, and because I think like like univariate sum check is is like super simple. Um, as long as you have like a polynomial division, I guess, right? Like all, all you really do in univariate sum check is uh, compute, like the prover just sends a quotient polynomial. Like that's it. Like, you know, some polynomial Q is claimed to be 
uh, divisible by some um, like, you know, uh, the, the thing that kills nth root to unity. So you have to divide Q by, sorry, Q, I should mean, okay. So you have to compute the quotient, which is H, you know, some, some two n variant thing divided by X to the n minus one. Um, and that's, and then, and then the prover just like KZG commits uh, to that quotient polynomial and like, that's it. <laughs> um, so if you're just looking to get something interesting implemented, like Mar Marlin plus a univariate thing might be um, the way to go, uh, just because the polynomial IOP underlying Marlin shouldn't be super complicated to implement. But anyway, yes, I guess those are my pointers for you. Like have have a look at at, at Hyperplunk if you're looking to use Fry or KZG, which are univariate commitments, but you want to apply it to something like GKR. And that's one option. Two option is 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 just like implement Marlin. Um, you know, feel free to substitute Fry for KZG if you don't want to use KZG. And option three would be um, to use um, Hyrax commit or Bulletproof commit directly for as as a multilinear polynomial commitment. Um, and I don't have very strong feelings about which of these three would be like the least implementation effort. They might actually be about the same. Um, this would be the one that I know the least about because I kind of need to study the Gemini transformation in a little more detail myself. Uh, but it kind of, it looks a lot like, like Fry <laughs> uh, itself. Um, this is the newest, like this would be the most novel by the way, because people haven't really, you know, uh, Hyperplank, uh, the updated version of Hyperplank, which just came out quite recently, is the first time. I mean, I think people were generally aware of this, but Hyperplank is the first time it was written down. Like, hey, you know, there's nothing special about KZG and Gemini. They're really giving like a nice transformation from univariate to multilinear commitment schemes. Um, let's swap out KZG for Fry. So this is uh, this is new. So if, if novelty is appealing, um, you know, not many implementations out there of having looked at the cost profile of this or something, then that might be a reason to go for one. Um, yeah, but I think they might, they, they all should roughly be the same order of magnitude and um, difficulty. Okay, I'm going to stop babbling. <laughs> I hope this was not. That's awesome. No, thank you so much for this. This gives me a good direction. I, I plan on kind of like trying to implement like uh, most of these just to kind of, it's more learning than like trying to, you know, come up with a super optimized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I appreciate this path. It it helps me a lot. Okay, great. Yeah, and if you have more questions, like let me know. I mean, I'm excited to hear that you're um, going to put in the effort to do these implementations. Um, so I'd like to help however I can, and also just hear how it goes. Um, I'm sure that if uh, uh, if there's a way to help others go down this path in the future, um, it would be like very appreciated. Since I think it's a heavy lift. Uh, you ha you know. That as you've maybe discovered since you've been implementing some of these things already. Yeah, for sure. I, I think I, uh, I plan on kind of doing some write-ups and sharing the code as well. So I'll that, that'd, be, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be great if you're willing to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I should probably what? head to sleep. But yeah, if there's, I could take one or one, one more question maybe. Do you have, yeah, do you have time for a very quick question? Yeah, um, yeah still sure. Off topic. So... Um, I'm implementing the uh, KZG10 commitment scheme in CUDA, and okay. I have the multi-exponentiation based on Pippinger almost finished. Okay. But in what context are uh, extension fields used in KZG10? Um, so this is just KZG polynomial commitments? Yeah, is it is it based... So our degree, our extension fields based on the commitment scheme that you use or on the poly IOP? Oh, so... Well, so when you what, when, when you're using KZG commitments because they require elliptic curves, um, they require and pairing friendly ones to boot, they're going to force your field to be really big anyway. Um, most people would use BLS twelve three eight one, although there are some other options too. This is like a three two to three eighty one size field or something. Um, that's plenty big. The you shouldn't you don't need an extension field. Um, the reason to have an extension field is if you want to work over like a 64-bit field, and now 
some parts of the protocol that sound this error, like one over field size, and that's not small enough for cryptographic security. So you bring in the extension field to kind of artificially increase the field size from two to 64 up to something bigger, like at least two to 128. Um, but yeah, if you're using KZG commitments, you're going to be working over a gigantic field anyway. You shouldn't need an extension field. Uh, does that make sense? Am I misunderstanding? No, it it, it does. But I, I'm I'm using uh, using BN two hundred and fifty four, and okay. I'm, I'm converting um, Aztec's Baratinburg uh, mm. code base to to CUDA, and mm -hmm. they, they they implement G two G four G G sixteen arithmetic. Mm. Oh, okay. All right. So you're dealing with the extension fields because of the pairings. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, but it's it's still BN two fifty four. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have to ask some some friends who know more about this stuff. Um, can you can you put the question in the in the chat? I, I'll get yeah, a, an, an answer to you tomorrow. Pretty pretty. You know, it'll be easy. You know, just query the Oracle. Um, but uh, yeah, like you, you just need to know just a teeny bit more than I do about exactly what these target groups look like in these pairing friendly groups. Um, I know there are subgroups of some extension field um, and, you know, I, I think the 12 in BLS 12381 means the degree of the extension field and you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, I, I'll know the right person to ask who will know all this off the top of their head and, and just get you the answer in the chat. Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, cool. Any any other questions? So you could give it two more minutes if anyone does have one. All right. Okay, so I'll look out for that chat. Um, and otherwise, um, yeah, look forward to seeing you next week. And if anything comes up in the meantime, um, put it in the chat and I'll try to answer it. So thanks so much for coming and staying for so long as always. And I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the meeting. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye.